what are you uh what are you excited about about these uh several years that are upcoming in terms of cluster build outs in terms of uh, breakthroughs in AI like the best possible future you can imagine in the next couple of years two three four years what does that look like just it, it could be very specific technical things like breakthroughs on post post training or it could be just size big yeah i mean it's, it's impressive it's, clusters i really i really enjoy tracking supply chain and like who's involved <laughs> in what yeah. i really do it's really fun to see like the numbers the cost yeah. who's building what capacity helping them figure out how much capacity they should build winning deals strategic stuff that's really cool i think technologically uh there's a lot around the networking side that really excites me uh with optics and electro electronics right like kind of getting closer and closer whether it be co-package optics or some sort of like forms of new forms of switching this is internal to a, a, cluster. a cluster yeah um, also, multi data center training, right? Like, there's uh, people are putting so much fiber between these data centers and lighting it up with so many different, you know, with so much bandwidth that there's a lot of interesting stuff happening on that end, right? Telecom has been really boring since 5G, and now it's like really exciting again. Um, on can, the you educa- side. can you educate me a little bit about the speed of things? So, the speed of memory versus the speed of interconnect versus the speed of fiber between data centers? Are, the, is, are these like orders of magnitude different? Is, can we at some point converge towards a place where it all just feels like one computer? Uh, no, I don't think okay. that's possible. All right. um, <laughs> it's gonna, it's only gonna get harder to program, not easier. Okay. Um, it's only gonna get more difficult and complicated and more layers. Right. Uh, the the general image that people like to have is like this hierarchy of memory. So on chip is really close, localized within the chip. Right. You know, there you have registers. Right. And those are shared between some compute elements, and then you'll have caches, which are shared between more compute elements. And then you have like memory, right? Like HBM or DRAM, or like DDR memory or whatever it is, and that's shared between the whole chip. Um, and then you can have, you know, pools of memory that are shared between many chips, right? Um, and then storage and it keep, you keep zoning out, right? The access latency across data centers, across within the data center, within a chip is different. So like you're obviously always, you're always going to have different um, programming paradigms for this. It's not going to be easy. Programming this stuff is going to be hard. Maybe I can help, right? Um, you know, with programming this. But the, the, the way to think about it is that like there is... There, there's sort of like the more elements you add to a task, you you don't gain, you don't get strong scaling, right? If I double the number of chips, I don't get two x the performance, right? This is just like a reality of computing because uh, there's inefficiencies, um, and there's a lot of interesting work being done to make it not you know, uh, to make it more linear, whether it's making the chips more networked together more tightly or, uh, you know, cool programming models or cool algorithmic things that you can do on the model side, right? DeepSeek did some of these really cool innovations because they were limited on interconnect, but they still needed to parallelize, right? Like all sorts of, you know, all everyone's always doing stuff. Google's got a bunch of work and everyone's got a bunch of work about this. Um, that stuff is super exciting on the model and workload and innovation side, right? Hardware, uh, solid state transformers are interesting, right? For the power side, there's all sorts of stuff on batteries and there's all sorts of stuff on, you know, I think I think when you look at, if you look at every layer of the compute stack, right? Whether it goes from lithography and etch all the way to like fabrication, to like optics, to networking, to power, to transformers, to cooling, to, you know, a networking and you just go on up and up and up and up the stack, you know, even air conditioners for data centers are like innovating, right? Like it's like, there's like copper cables are innovating, right? Like you wouldn't think it, but copper cables like are, there's some innovations happening there with like the density of uh, how you can pack them. And like, it's like all of these layers of the stack all the way up to the models, it, human progress is at a pace that's never been seen before. I'm just imagining you sitting back in a layer somewhere with screens everywhere, just monitoring the supply chain where all these clusters, like all the information you're gathering I mean, you there's, do there's a big team. There's a big team. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> you're you you do quite incredible work uh, with semi analysis. I mean, it's just uh, keeping your finger on the pulse of human civilization in the digital world. It's pretty cool. Like just to watch, to feel that. Yeah, thank you. If, I guess uh... feel feel all of us like doing shit, <laughs> epic shit. Feel the AGI. <laughs> feel the. I mean. From meme to like reality, um, what Nathan is there like breakthroughs that you're like looking forward to potentially? I had a while to think about this while listening to Dylan's beautiful response. <laughs> he didn't um, listen to me. He was um, so no. I knew, knew, no, I knew this was coming. And it's like realistically, training models is very fun because there's so much low hanging fruit. And the thing that makes my job entertaining, I train models. I write analysis about what's happening with models, and it's fun because they're 
is obviously so much more progress to be had. And the real motivation why I do this like, somewhere where I can share things is that there's just, I don't trust people that are like, trust me, bro, we're going to make AI good. It's like, we're the ones that it's like, we're going to do it and you can trust us and we're just going to have all the AI. And it's just like, I would, would like a future where more people have a say in what AI is and can understand it. And that's it's, it's a little bit less fun that it's not a like positive thing of like this is just all really fun like training models is fun and bringing people in is fun but it's really like ai if it is going to be the most powerful technology of my lifetime it's like we need to have a lot of people involved in making that and M making it <laughs> o making it open helps with that as accessible as possible as open as possible yeah in the my read of the last few years is that more openness would help the AI ecosystem in terms of having more people understand what's going on, whether that's researchers from non-AI fields to governments to everything. It doesn't mean that openness will always be the answer. I think then it will reassess of like what is the biggest problem facing AI and tack on a different angle to the wild ride that we're on. And uh, for me, just from even the user experience, anytime you have the, like Apathy said, the, the aha moments, like the magic, like seeing the reasoning, the chain of thought. It's like, there's something really just fundamentally beautiful about that. It's uh, putting a mirror to ourselves and seeing like, oh shit, it, it is solving intelligence as the cliche like goal of these companies is. And you get to understand to what, why we humans are special. The intelligence within us is special. And for now also why we're special in terms of, we seem to be conscious in the AI systems for now. Uh, aren't and we get to solve we get to explore that mystery so that's it's just really cool to get to explore these questions that i don't think i, I would have never imagined uh would be even possible uh back when uh so just watching with excitement deep blue beat kasparov like i wouldn't have ever thought this kind of ai would be possible in my lifetime it's like this is really feels like ai yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> I started with AI of learning to fly a cilia quad rotor. It's like learning to fly and it was just like, it learned to fly up, it would hit the ceiling and stop and catch it. It's like, okay, that is like really stupid compared to what's going on now. And now you could probably with natural language tell it to learn to fly and it's going to generate the control algorithm required to do that. Probably. <laughs> There's low level blockers. Like we had to do some weird stuff for that, yeah, but you for can, sure. you, you definitely Back can. Back to our robotics conversation. Yeah, when you have to interact in actual physical world, it's hard.